so Tom, we're on board uh, Seahorse, which is um, yeah one of the boats within the withdrawn um, exhibition that's here in Lee Woods in Bristol. Um, and I'm, you know, we're here today so I can talk to you about your research. Um, and you've been studying the ocean and law, the law of the sea, law of the ocean, the yeah. seabed, um, ownership of the of the sea, I suppose, for maybe a decade or so. I, I yeah, suppose. yeah, well, yeah, actually, yeah, probably more than a decade. Um, so, should we just sort of uh, talk about some of the basic parameters of of the field? So. In terms of the, the the seabed, sort of who, or in terms of the sea, who owns the sea around the UK? Oh, that's a really good question. See, in law, you've got to suspend your disbelief here because it's law we're talking about. The sea doesn't technically exist. Basically, that you ignore the sea bit and you just look at the seabed. Okay. So the seabed itself is owned generally at 12 miles by an organisation by the Crown Estate called the Crown Estate Commissioners. Right. And then the water above it is ownerless but there are certain rights which exist in that and one of the one is the public right to navigate that's why boats can navigate more or less anywhere and the other one is the public right to fish um, outside the 12 mile limit out to the 200 mile limit we have what's called an exclusive economic zone which gives us sovereign rights over the fishery but it's not quite the same they're slightly less than the well, tell me about the, the the right to fish who has the right to fish that's really, it should be a simple, simple answer, but it's not. Uh, essentially, essentially, the right to fish is owned, probably, it's not quite certain, but it's owned by the Crown on behalf of the public. So you, me and everyone else technically have a right to fish in the sea, which is why you can go and see anglers fishing in the sea or in tidal waters anywhere around the UK. So they don't need a licence, they can just go, anyone can, you, you take your kids out and go crabbing. Okay, so you don't, need, you don't need a licence? No. So what do you need a licence for? And then, Because I understand there's, there's a lot of debates and arguments and these licences are these sort of yeah. very valuable items for fishermen. So what's a, what's a licence for? You need a licence for two things. One of them is this, actually, funny enough, a fishing boat. Oh, OK. So you need a licence for a fishing vessel and, well, motor-powered fishing vessel. There's some debate, um, I, the law might have changed recently, but there's been some debate whether a sail and all powered fishing vessel actually needs a licence. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but, so, uh, but you need a licence for a fishing vessel, but also a uh, quota is, sits on that fishing vessel, but they, you, you can trade the quota that goes with that, the quota, the amount of fish you can land of certain species uh, is tradable and that's, that goes with vessel licences, but you can buy and sell it from one vessel to another. So, I mean, uh, uh, through the research I've been doing for this project, I understand that, that there's been a lot of overfishing and there's far less fish in the sea now compared to, I don't know, 50 years ago, 150 years ago, where for some species, where, you know, like the common skate uh, isn't quite common at all. It's this sort of, <laughs> it's incredibly rare skate. We're yeah. down to maybe 5% of fish stocks yeah. compared to, you know, industrial levels, pre-industrial pre levels before fishing. Yeah, I mean, it's place. not, it, if you look at the, his, go to Callum Roberts's work, or just, just go and look in a light, you know, go down to Lube and go around one of those buildings and you'll see massive great big fish that they used to land. Right. And we've, we've, we've fished it all out. And, and I mean, if you want to ask why, it's death by a thousand cuts, it's multiple reasons. One of them, probably the first, the biggest reason of the lot, is this bizarre assumption that everyone, that you start off with, with the sea, with the bizarre assumption that everyone can fish anywhere using whatever gear they like until we get round to making it illegal. So one of the reasons why, one of the projects I got involved in in Scotland was setting up um, the Community of Aaron Seabed Trust, the first um, marine reserve set up by a community, even though it's very small, it was incredibly difficult to do because it was unprecedented. People don't close off areas of sea to allow marine regeneration. So we haven't, on land, we've been shutting off areas like this woodland that we're in now for years. Yeah. But we haven't done that in the sea. You can so they fish did anywhere that in, in, on, in the bay because it was, very, it was also very easy to sort of measure the sort of stop and start of the, of the, of the territory. Yeah. There's a sort of entrance and an exit to, to the bay and then you've got hills and mountains either side so you can exactly say exactly there's no there should be no fishing 
in this area. Yeah, but it's only a couple of square kilometres, and I, I forget the UK water something like two hundred and seventy thousand square miles. You know, yeah. <laughs> so in terms of marine protected areas around the UK, what have you got a sense of what percentage? It's really have difficult. Been protected. I, I, yeah, it's really difficult that because you get all sorts of banded figures banded around, none of which are probably correct. Um, because you've got a lot of areas, a lot of areas designated on maps as marine protected areas. So right. if you speak to the government, they'll turn around and say, "Oh yes, that's a marine protected area." But when you go and look around and see what it's protected against, you know, um, there's one that, that just on south of Arran, they've just designated a 300 square kilometre marine protected area. Really? No, man no management measures in it yet. Oh, okay. It doesn't actually stop anything. So it doesn't stop trawling. Or it doesn't anything. stop anything. Well, there's a few areas where where uh, of reef which are protected, but they're small. And so the vast area appears on the map as a marine protected area, but when you look at it, it isn't. So it's tiny compared, compared to what we would expect. You're probably only talking one or two percent. Yeah, okay, well, that makes sense. So we are moving in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, my guess is that these areas have to be designated before um, they start getting enforced. So you sort of define the space first yeah. and then you'd say well you need perhaps one or two legal cases to come in and take a trawler to court for, for well and, and we've we've through work that i i did um with the marine conservation society an organization called client earth we took sites under the habitats directive which are european sites which are designated for their features um and we took that to we um we, i mean i provided the legal part of the legal advice and we a threatened judicial review with the British government and that was successful in that now a whole load of inshore management measures are in place which are put in place by the inshore fisheries and conservation authorities. A lot of their work has been dealing with that. Um, Brilliant. So yeah that was really good but offshore the management measures aren't aren't there yet. <laughs> right. So that's all right within the six mile limit of England um, and Wales brought in similar management measures, Scotland's a bit further down, a bit further back. Hmm. That's interesting. So, so who owns this? So the sea, no one owns the water, but the land, the the, ocean, the seabed is owned by the crown yeah. estate. Um, so, if trawlers were to come in, or the mining industry were to come and decimate the seabed, what what should be the well, it's an interesting question. This, like, if we come in here in this beautiful woodland, yeah, with bulldozers. And we just carve a massive, we just take out half the trees, well, there's going to be issues. Whereas if you do that with the seabed, no one's sort of going to notice so much because it's underwater and then you can kind of get away with it. Is that now, generally when, when, the... when, when you put these fishing boats in here, <laughs> yeah. did you have to go through any complicated licensing? Oh program? my god! <laughs> well, um, <laughs> and actually, if you were to mine the seabed, you would have you'd still have to get. You probably have to do environmental impact assessment. You certainly have to get a license from the yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I mentioned there was something called public right to fish. Public right to fish allows you to fish using whatever gear you like until it's illegal. So what you t what tends to have happened in the past is that is that people have kind of invent as as you've depleted a stock, they've invented a new fishery. So a, um, a new fishery or a new way to catch a new fish. way to catch fish. Yeah, because I understood that I've been. Uh, you know, there's, all, there's obviously this sort of uh, trawling where you're dragging metal chains across the seabed, knackering and just scooping up every last fish. Yeah, well, They're, aren't they using electrocution? Oh, there's been... Dutch beam trawlers, Dutch electric beam trawlers. I mean, I, again, I've got no, that's got some sort of special exemption, I think, from the EU. I've got no idea how that happens at all. But if I just, if I just go back a little bit, what's happened over the years is we've, we've, we've got, um, so to start with, you'd have, we would have, if we were to get into a time machine and go back a thousand years, Lovely. when the public right to fish started off, yeah. we were out in the seven, we'd be in our little coracle. Oh, know. beautiful, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good. And we couldn't with our little rod and line and maybe some sort of net, we might have some stakes on the shore. Yeah. Apart from the stuff that you could actually get to from the shoreline, where we were probably already doing damage, actually, the Magna Carta has got stuff about shoreline fisheries, trying yeah. to ban them. But at sea, we would have been able to do very little damage. Um, but what has happened is you've got this incremental shift as we've taken out a stock so we've had to become more and more invasive and more and more desperate in our race to catch fish yeah so particularly with the advent of the diesel engine which just meant you could put in a whole load more power 
Yeah. But the sailing vessels weren't as powerful as diesel vessels. Yeah. And also with the diesels, you can you can go out fishing any time you like. Yeah, you can. All winds and weathers, uh, and into areas which you couldn't normally get to. So that's opened up this ability to to use very invasive gears. Now, my argument has long been, well, hang on, wait a second, um, me and my coracle and my fishing line, now that's clearly fishing. Yeah. Whereas, actually, where you take a fishery like a, a scallop dredge, which is basically dragging steel bags across the surface of the seabed, that's a really invasive activity. So you're looking at something there which is more akin to mining. Now, mining, you would get an environmental impact assessment and a license from the seabed owner. Yeah. Whereas scallop dredging, you don't. You've still got to have a license for your vessel, and there are certain closed areas. Um, but generally, at the pre the sort of starting point, if you like, this is an activity that you should be you, you're allowed to do almost anywhere, and it should be the other way around. It's the sort of thing that should have a massive health warning before before you do it. And the trouble is with those sorts of fisheries is that um, they they take out what what is called as fishing down the food web. So. They are often the prey species of the largest, the sort of more things that we would, the scallop being a sort of shellfish, yeah. that sits on, lives on the seabed, and they're often the prey species of the species that live in the water column. Yeah. So if you take out the stuff that lives on the seabed, yeah. and in the process you, you also destroy the kind of marine flora and fauna, a lot of which lives in the shallow seabed. Yeah, so and that's where the little fish would be growing up anyway, isn't it? Yeah. So you take all of that lot out, Sure, you'll have a sustainable scallop, sustainable in inverted commons, <laughs> scallop fishery, and that you might be able to go back year after year and they'll be there. But the the bycat, the destruction of all the other biodiversity and the other fish species that might live there, is the problem with that kind of thing. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And you just because all all the bigger fish have also been caught. The massive, you know, yeah. the, the, the the giant rays, you know, the sharks. It's huge halibut. I think um, <laughs> Robert, uh, Callum Roberts was talking about how we're maybe down to 10% of the large fish um, that are sort of left in the sea. The rest have been gone. They're all sort of depleted. And, yeah. um, and I, you know, I was reading that, uh, um, you know, a hundred years ago, you'd go out fishing <clears throat> around the UK and you'd be worried that sharks were going to come and steal your catch. Yeah, like the old man of the sea. Yeah, like the old man of the sea. And yeah. that's, you know, it's not the case now, you know. It, you no, just don't... they're just, they're not there. And also, they were doing things like catching bluefin tuna in the North Sea a hundred years ago. Those are amazing fish. They're, <laughs> they're a, a, you know, they're a hot-blooded fish. Yeah, they are. Huge, yeah. hot-blooded fish. I mean, those are, that's ridiculous. I mean, the whole, the, the thing is, is a, is a remarkable species, and yet we are... The idea of catching one of those off Scotland, <laughs> it just... Or yeah. now, now you sort of think you catch a mackerel and you think, wow, that's it's amazing. amazing. <laughs> and, and, and so we have we've really have done an enormous amount of, uh, of damage. But not just, it's not just to the, I mean, I, I, I'm always a bit careful about, you know, you sit on a fishing boat. I, I'm, I'm always a bit careful about bashing the fishing industry. Yes. Yeah. It, isn't, it isn't the fishermen's fault. They've been allowed though in, in some cases encouraged through the way the quota system works and through the way subsidy works and just through the way the permitting system works to follow those particular avenues. So for instance, scallop dredging is not a quota species. Oh, okay. So if I have to rent quota in, to, to, if I get a new fishing boat, I have to rent quota in from somebody else if I want to go after cod. Or I can just go and buy some dredges and go straight after scallops. What would you do? You know, so actually the way there's a, a lot of very, very peculiar yeah. incentives on the way the market works. And also, you know, there's not that many not work. that many jobs either in, in Cornwall, other than that in the, the tourist industry. I mean that Yeah, but that, you've got mortgages to pay and all the other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the, the tragedy is is that by fishing for those sort of species ultimately it leads to less jobs. And, and well, you yeah. see that up the west coast of Scotland, which is Purely they fish for prawns or Dublin Bay prawns and longustines. Beautiful looking things. They're kind of like prawns with really long fingers. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and, and scallops. And if you go up and you look at the numbers of fishermen up there now, there's, uh, there's, it's a much reduced number to how it used to be sort of 20, 30 years yeah. ago. Yeah, so they're, they're kicking themselves in the... In a, well, they're, they're, they're destroying their own industry. It's not them. It's the, the system is encouraging them to destroy their own industry. Okay. That's, it's, a, it's, really, it's a really important point because they are, I mean, I don't really 
like the concept of an economic rational economist's rational man but that is what's happening is that that's a perfectly reasonable response to the system that they've been handed yeah okay so how is your work sort of benefiting the industry or benefiting the, the sea well I, I I don't really see myself as a conservationist I do think that what you're looking at is a is a public resource and I'm as an academic I'm a public servant so I my my hope is that what I'm trying what I'm, what I'm doing with my work is I'm balancing it out so I'm saying look okay yeah that obviously we should be protecting some for biodiversity but we should all also be protecting the marine or managing the marine environment for marine communities and that 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 includes you know sustainable fishermen so potters people doing minimal impact wildlife yeah. tourism sea anglers those sorts of things should have a voice it is a public it is a pub, it is the public's right to fish so actually it's fair that what the way it's managed is that all those sectors have a voice in the way that, that it is put together in the way that it's controlled. And if you take in there are some really good areas of practice in the UK. But you're so you're but you're aiming to sort of and you're beginning to change the law to to of the for the benefit of everybody. Is that that's yeah. generally what and also the way I try and do it is I try and do it without changing the law. So that what I'm saying is well this is this is what the law says and this is what everyone's doing. And this, if this is a public resource you can't justify just managing the Firth of Clyde for prawns and scallops. Where, where does the wildlife tourists get in there? What about the sea anglers? Wouldn't they, you know, all they, what about all those? Sh surely it should be managed for the broader community. And that's actually what the law says already. So a lot of what I do isn't about changing the law. It's about changing the way, ch just reminding people what the law says they should be doing. Okay. And you're, and you're, work, well, you're a researcher at the University of West of England, but also uh, you're on various boards of charity so you work for the Blue Marine Foundation. Yeah, yeah. And what, so what is it you, you're doing for them? Well, I, um, I'm a, again, I'm a, a lawyer on the board there, so I give sort of strategic advice as to what we're doing. And we've got a number of projects, um, one in Lime Bay in Dorset, um, where we've, um, we've worked with the fishermen and academics from Plymouth University to, um, to design a sustainably managed fishery which has got scientific input so you've got reference areas or control areas where there, where there is no fishing taking place uh, and uh, the fishermen themselves are essentially managing self-managing the site to see how productive they can make it yeah. and in return for that we're, we're working with Marks and Spencers and people like that to ensure decent pricing for it. Brilliant and is it is it paying off Are fish stocks beginning to recover? That's the sense. Great yeah that's really good and it's managed by the fishermen themselves. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah, or with the help, <laughs> I mean, I say that, it's, it's with the help of the, some, the English inshore waters have got something called the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority. Now, they're quite unusual bodies in that the boards that sit on them have got people from environment groups, sea anglers, fishermen, sitting on the boards already. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, it's like a lot of these things. If you try and pinpoint it and say, oh, it's just this group of people who've really done it, it never is. It's, yeah. always, it's, always, it's always, you know, everybody waking up, the fishermen, the public, waking up and saying, well, actually, this is something that, 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 that can't go on. Particularly when you sort of see it so starkly put by people like Callum Roberts. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so how do you see that the future sort of panning out? We're going to have more marine protected areas around the UK that are going to be enforced. It, or is there going to be a sudden shift in the in the in the laws of fishing? This is really it's a desert, it's a difficult question. I mean, there's two. There's one thing we've not talked talk, talked about, uh, and that is um, quota ownership among yeah, fishermen. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the p piece of work, and there's actually there's a judicial review by Greenpeace at the moment about the allocation of the UK's quota. Yeah. And how under the reformed common fisheries policy, it's meant to be allocated on the basis of sustainability. Right. And actually, it's 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 a very dark art quota management. But the idea, I think, what's happening is it's behind the scenes, it's concentrating into fewer and fewer hands. Yeah. And that is again leading to the actual fishermen on the ground having to buy in quota and potentially go, you know, they're going bust. Yeah, and it puts the puts the so it puts the prices up of the quota, isn't it? So it puts the prices up of the quota, and it means that they will go and go for non-quota stocks. 
Yeah. Or, so so there, there's that. I mean, what um, what I would like to see in the future, I think, is is I mean, wild capture fish should be a premium product. Yeah. Um, I'd like that recognised in the way that's priced. Okay. I would like. I I think marine people working at sea, those jobs are really really interesting nice jobs i mean so many people now spend their lives sitting in front of a computer all day long i think it's a tragedy and so I, it's it's a marine employment and particularly fishing employment is something i'd like to see more of i'd just like to see the sort of way things are priced reflecting that what you're getting is an incredible wild animal so you think there should be a difference between the yeah the sustainably caught wild uh, capture fish wild catch and then there's this sort of Farmed inshore, well, farmed farm salmon. For, yeah, because they're doing farm sea bass now. So, so there should be a, a, a really mar market um, um, kind of salmon, yeah, and salmon so catching farm, pens. And so, yeah, so farm. I mean, there's a sea, they're different. Sea bass is not. Yeah, these are completely different products. You know, <laughs> yeah, one is one is a yeah. one is a you know something that's growing up in the wild, and the other one is something that's been stuck in a tank and just just yeah. whacked out with chemicals. Yeah. So, I'd like to see I'd like to see some sort of uncoupling in the pricing of that. I'd like to see recognition uh, that, that what you're looking at is a really premium product. I'd also like to see much more space made over for, for nature conservation and, um, and uh, things like sea angling. Um, but in the, in the mix of things, and I think if you can get stocks to recover, hmm. I think you can achieve all those things. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if, if some stocks are down at sort of 2%, yeah. I mean, if, if we can bring them up to 10%, 15 20 percent of what they should be then fishermen will be laughing they'd just be sort of scooping the fish out <laughs> of the sea i i do feel <laughs> i mean if you say that but actually if you think about what you're trying to organize as a fisherman you've got so many different variable prices because you've got your diesel you've got your you you don't know what how much you're uh, how much you're going to be selling your fish for yeah you don't know when you catch it particularly with the way quota works you don't know necessarily whether you've got the right quota for the right species for a mixed fishery you might have to rent that in you don't know what you're paying for that mm. there are so many variables there for yeah. a fishing business to actually operate that's on. really difficult way to make a living it's a really <laughs> difficult way to make a living you have to be you know you, these you know you almost have to be a mathematical genius to make it work like that so so um yeah, you. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got ourselves a visitor. Look, there we go. Someone, someone has brought a teddy bear, which they're photographing on the boat, right in front of us. Right in front of us. <laughs> I think, which is very nice. But I, I think it's it's probably maybe a hint for us to call him today <laughs> <laughs> and, and wrap up the film. It's lovely uh, to see you again, Tom. Yeah, and, you too. Um, thanks for your. Um, well done for doing this project. It's it's excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Cheers.